Welcome. My name is Teresa Mai. Today, I have the honor of introducing to you the congregation of the Carmelites of the Western Province. Um, here with me today are the uh, friars from different part of the Carmelite um, location. And uh, we're sitting in this beautiful place of Mount St. Joseph Carmelite Monastery in San Jose, California. So before we begin, I would like to do a brief introduction of those who are present here today. Let's start with you, Father. Hi, my name is Father Stephen Watson. I'm the provincial of the Western Province of Discalced Carmelites of the United States. I entered the order in 1977, and I live in Southern California where the provincial office is. My name is Brother Matthias of the Immaculate Heart. I entered in 2010, and I'm currently living in Mount Angel, Oregon, um, in our community there and going to seminary at Mount Angel Seminary, preparing for priesthood. Wonderful. My name is Father Robert. I entered the Carmelites in 1999. I am currently now stationed at our novitiate in Mount St. Joseph, San Jose. My name is Brother Jason of the Holy Spirit. I am currently stationed at our retreat house in Redlands, California, and I have uh, been with the order since 2006. Welcome. Hi, my name is uh, Brother Joseph Mayor of the Child Jesus. I joined it in uh, 2013, and I'm currently stationed here. Wonderful. Uh, my name is Brother Juan de la Cruz, and I have been here for two years. And one, I am one of the brothers' information here in Mount St. Joseph. Too. Wonderful. Welcome, all of you. So before we get started, we wanted to um, learn a little bit about the history. Could you kindly share with us what um, the, you know, who founded the order and how long ago um, was the order found and by whom? Well, often the very first response to that question is, we were founded in Palestine, in the Holy Land, mm -hmm. in the Middle Ages, back in the 13th century. However, I like to remind people that we are the Discalced Carmelites, and actually we look to St. Teresa mm -hmm. of Avila, also known to us as St. Teresa of Jesus, <clears throat> as the foundress of our Discalced Order. And in fact, this year we're celebrating the fifth centenary of her birth. Wow. Yeah. Um, so... Really, our roots are more in the Spanish Carmelite order, uh, and we, we it's a, complicated, a little bit of a complicated story, but we broke off from the, uh, the ancient observance or the order of Carmel, and we are, are actually a separate order now. Sometimes you hear us referred to as the Teresian Carmelites to distinguish us from the Carmelites. Our province, uh, the Irish, Discalced Carmelite Fathers came to Los Angeles in 1924. However, the uh, uh, Discalced Carmelite uh, friars from Catalonia, Spain, came to Arizona via Mexico, where they had been for several decades, uh, but they were uh, kind of chased out of Mexico because of the, the revolution that was going on there and a lot of uh, anti-Catholicism, but particularly to foreign priests. And of course, the Spanish Carmelites were foreign, so they more or less had to flee north, and they came to Arizona. So in 1964, the Carmelites in Arizona joined with the Carmelites in California, and hence we became known as the California-Arizona province. I see. So... What is the future plan for um, the congregation now that you are established in California? We are in, in four western states from Canada to Mexico. Uh, uh, expansion is always good, but not just for the sake of, of expansion, but to, be of, uh, to, to share our patrimony, our spiritual patrimony uh, with the people of God and to participate in the new evangelization that the Pope is calling us to, the Church is calling us to, you know, to be messengers of the, of the gospel and bring the joy of the gospel to people. That's what our plans are. 
can I have the audience um, listen to some of your story, like how you were called? What does it mean by the call? As far as the call, it's just being open to God, to his will, to his dreams for us, his plan. Because I know for me, I used to be afraid of what does this mean? Is He's going to make me do something I don't want to do. Yeah. And I say, no, okay, I don't want to put my life in your hands. And then slowly he'd lead me deeper and deeper into saying, yes, you are good and you're going to take care of me. You're my father. And a call is a realization of God's will, of his plan for your life. Um, not a way of controlling, but a way of discovery yeah. and openness to it. Uh, and that in the Catholic tradition, manifests itself as marriage, uh, priesthood, consecrated life, mm -hmm. religious, brothers, sisters, and single people in a generous life. Mm. Uh, and when you discover that vocation, then you discover how your talents can be used. This calling is unfolding constantly throughout your life unto heaven. How did God call you? <laughs> Brother Jason. <laughs> um, <clears throat> my... Uh, my story was a little bit different. Um, I, uh, I, I, I was going to school at uh, Franciscan University of Steubenville at the time. And um, I, it, for some reason, those, those years, I, I really didn't feel called to anything. It was kind of a, a funny thing. So not to marriage, not to anything. Before I had, but, but not at this point. It seemed kind of like there was a, a major absence. And it was something that was bothering me. Um, why the Lord did it, I, I imagine at least part of the reason why is because he wanted me to focus on studies. I'm not sure, but um, I know that at the very end of that, um, we were on spring break. It was um, uh, March, so about, about now, and uh, we're um, driving to New York for a spring break. A, a bunch of us were going to, to be at a friend's house, and on the way over there, the person who was driving us um, was someone who is now Sister Sean Pauline with the Carmelite Sisters of the Most Sacred Heart of Los Angeles, um, uh, then Janet Burke. And she was telling us her vocation story as we're going across Pennsylvania to New York. And she was telling us her uh, vocation story. And as she's explaining it, um, or when she's done explaining it, she turns to me and says, so Jason, are you called to the priesthood? Now, we don't often consider many other options. We kind of just think priests uh, for the men, priests or marriage or single life. But um, <clears throat> so I've learned more since then. But I remember at that moment, I was hearing the question and I was surprised um, because I said yes. Uh, I, I was very surprised. In fact, I didn't think I was the one who said it. I thought it was someone else <laughs> in the car. Um, uh, but but there it was. I said yes, and I kind of felt a little funny about it. I thought, oh my goodness, did I just lie to these people? What's going on? But it was at that moment, like even through the spring break um, and, and definitely beyond um, through the other things I was doing, it just grew and grew and grew. And so I guess that was the moment where uh, the Lord was, was guiding me forward into a more active discernment uh, in, in uh, consecrated life. How about you, Father? Yeah. In regards to what is a call, I think what is implied in, in both our brother's story is that it doesn't come from ourselves. It's not like, what am I going to do with my life? But it's a gradual discovery of what is God's dream for my life. And so as Christians, that's, that's how I understand destiny, is that God has a dream for every one of us. God has great desires and plans and hopes for how we can flourish uh, as individual persons, and by our becoming our best self, glorify Him. And so it's a matter of what will allow me to do that best. So we're all, we all have a calling, and essentially our common calling is love. How do I live a life of authentic, genuine love that will bring out the best in me? What is the state in life that I will allow God to work that mystery of love in, my, in myself? And so it takes on different forms, but I think that's what we have in common is it's a call to growing in love, which makes us fully human. And then as Jesus says, ultimately, you did not choose me, I chose you right. in regards to what shape will that take?
any of you fall in love before God call you? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, it's part of my story too is celibacy was a difficult thing, thinking about that. Like, um, it just seemed like this denial of who I am. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so when God called me in a fairly dramatic way, I was dating a woman, beautiful woman, uh, faithful Catholic, was discerning when to propose to her. Should it be on this feast day of St. Joseph or this feast day of St. Joseph? Because <laughs> we had prayed to St. Joseph asking for his guidance in our relationship and our futures. Um, it was a really a beautiful relationship of going deeper into loving another human being past their faults and, and thinking about a future together. But at the same time, there's this kind of a, a holy haunting mm. um, that was nothing negative, but just was there from the Lord. I think about priesthood sometimes. It would mm. kind of bring me back to that. And um, part of my story, I, maybe I won't share it now, maybe later, I suppose, but is getting over the fact that it's not so much sacrifice with celibacy. It, it's true, but it's more so this opening up to a universal love of everybody. It was difficult for me being with her and then being at the church when I was doing different ministries because I'd want to be for everybody, but I also want to be for her. I didn't want to neglect her. I was kind of torn. Mm. <clears throat> and I realized in my heart of hearts who I truly am, like Father was saying here, um, which matches up with God's dream for us, um, is this love that's for individuals, that's, that's wide, it's just part of who I am. Not that I'm not still attracted to women or different things, but I was most fulfilled giving myself uh, for the church, for people. I think it's much like a marriage where you have to rekindle the fire, you know, at times. <clears throat> not that it always has to be about feelings, but that commitment um, to love, to be, to be true to yourself, to be holy, um, to be God's. Each day, we need something to do that. And for us, community really helps a lot. Uh, for me, finding a brotherhood that would hold me accountable, mm -hmm. but also to help me to get over myself, my own selfishness, uh, was huge. And each day when I encounter the Lord in my brothers, uh, that's a reawakening. The love that I see with the brothers, with each other, the ministries, um, their prayer sitting in silence, that encourages me mm. to want to follow the same path. So just like a married couple would need to encourage each other to, to do that little something special, we try to do that for each other in ways of charity. And then we can let this intimacy with the Lord and our friendship and brotherhood with each other flow out past the walls um, in our ministries. How do you overcome I mean, the task that you don't like, right? Obviously, living in a community, like you said, is in a home. There's a significance to so much of what we can offer to the Lord. In other words, if we take the example of the Virgin Mary, she was greater than all of the apostles. God exalted this woman more than any other, any other preacher, any other priest. Uh, she was the masterpiece of all masterpieces of, in humanity. And yet, she did nothing extraordinary that we could see from external perspective. Mm -hmm. And everything that she did was totally simple and normal. And for ourselves, and yet it had extreme value. Mm -hmm. And be why? Because of the love, the relationship, what was coming from her heart, her intention. And for ourselves, that seeing the importance and the meaningfulness of ordinary mundane things that doesn't come automatic. It takes faith. In other words, we need to check ourselves. We need to remind ourselves why we're here, why are we doing what we're doing, for who are we doing it for. And just that intention and that awareness can change our attitude to be able to make it meaningful. And it's not just something part of our imagination, but it's something that shifts inside, inside our heart. And so a lot of it is a matter of choice. So just like we've been speaking about love inevitably. And love, 
as we mature as human beings, we start to realize feelings are part of it, but it's not the essence. It's not the heart and the most important part. Love is ultimately a choice. And in order for us to grow and mature as human beings, we can't be so attached to emotion to be on an emotional high all the time. In order for us to truly grow in virtue, um, in in what brings out the best in us and greatness in us, it means that we have to be tested and purified in making those right choices of what is good, not just for myself and what I get out of it, but what is good for what is needed for at the task at hand to get out of myself to do what is necessary for a greater good and when we make those choices in difficult circumstances when we're dry when we don't feel like being good but we do it anyway because it's the right thing when we are trained in that area of going through those kind of deserts that's what gives birth to deeper intimacy mm. and our capacity for relationship and what it means to be fully human. And, and that's, that's how I see holiness, I think that's how we see holiness, is what makes us fully human. And that's a fully human as made in the image of God, which has tremendous potential for greatness. And that's therefore our being inspired to follow our saints, to their example, and, and to learn from their friendship and then to be inspired by their teaching is so that way we could become saints. Do you feel that tug of war of the world calling you? Honestly, more and more the world is less and less attractive. Mm. Um, as you're growing in intimacy with God, that's what, I, what I'm tasting. Um, early on, for me, a big struggle was community life. Um, come, being an only child, coming into a family where, you know, brothers and sometimes you're butting heads or different things because they're human beings and we're helping each other to grow to, it's like two rocks to, together to smoothing out each other. God put us in community for at least that reason too, mm. but to love. Um, for me, that was a great struggle, and, but yet God's turning that on his head where more and more um, it's a brotherhood. Um, looking up to, to friars that I'd like to be like, uh, others I want to, to encourage, to help along, right. to, to find this pearl of great price who is Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. who we are gathered around. He's our center in our community and in our individual selves. But back to your question with, with the draw of the world, uh, it's all being purified. Even seeing like a married couple and they're happy like on my plane flight here, yeah. it was just great to watch a young married couple with their child and how they interacted and walked them around the plane and not be jealous, mm -hmm. those things, to see the beauty Absolutely. that's in there. Beauty of family life, um, to hopefully encourage them somehow. We're a part of lots of families too, right. as Carmelites and with this ministry. Um, they welcome us into their homes, into their lives. We're able to be brothers and fathers for them. That's a beautiful thing. I'm putting on the hat of a mom, let's say, who thinking, my goodness, I, it's my only child, and you sure, God, you want to take my child away too? And at home, I do everything for them, cooking and cleaning, and here they are, they're going to go join an order that they're going to have to do the cleaning, cooking, and even live together with others. I'm not ready to let go. What would you say to those moms? To share my experience with my own mom, I grew up as an only child, and but it was just my mom and I and the rest of our family. Me and my mom were always really close. She's a wonderful woman. And when I started to experience this transformation of what God was doing in my life, she didn't understand it. I didn't understand it, but I knew it was real. Mm -hmm. And she thought I was just going through another phase. So as she started seeing that I was getting more and more serious about what, God, what I felt God was asking, she started to resent it, I think. <laughs> and she really as she is open about now, she really didn't, uh, wasn't too excited about me going out to visit different communities. Mm. 
And in the beginning, she really was not in favor, but God started to work in her heart. Mm. That's, I think, what happened is when we, similar to what Brother Matthias was saying, the vocation, God isn't just drawing me as an individual. God is drawing all the relationships that are connected with me, whether directly or indirectly. Mm. It's not just a gift that he's giving me. It's a gift he's giving the people that I love most. Mm. And the person I love most is my mom. So she started to be blessed and she started to experience her own conversion in regards to deepening her faith life with the Lord. And now she's on fire. She's truly uh, on fire with the Holy Spirit. She loves the Lord. And, And God has brought out what's so the most beautiful in her as a person She's just flourishing, and, and God is bringing that about in her. Now that you became a Carmelite, and I'm trying to think of um, the time where people, you know, from the outside thinking, you know, once they become a priest, they live in a community, they shut, you know, the door to the war. Are you shutting the door to the war? Are you running away from the war? Or are you really, you know, be more available to the war? What, what is the truth here? I mean sound like you get relationship established within your family, but what about your friend? Do you cut the, those ties? Um, certainly, you're not running from the world. Um, you're, you're dealing with a, a broader number, as similar to, to what Brother Matthias said, you know, his love grows bigger, and it, and it grows to more people in a different way. Um, so you're really connecting with a lot of people. You're connecting uh, with the world in, in a lot of different ways and trying to share what the Lord's given to you and trying to, to learn from them what the Lord's given to them and, and grow together towards God. So you're really delving in. For the priests, I mean, you should answer this better than I do. You know, you hear the confessions. You're helping so directly with... Um, um, what the world struggles with and what they're casting off and what they're moving beyond. Um, so they, there's no running from the world in that way. Um, and, and friends, it's, uh, it's, it's different. I mean, you are pulled apart in some ways. Your schedule is different than a lot of people. You know, I, I uh, lived in different parts of the country um, as, as many of us have, um, some of us grew up there, and just trying to figure out what the time zones and calling people is, is, is complicated, uh, or writing people and whatever you're doing. So things can be um, a little different, but other times they're not. So I happen to live um, nearby where I grew up. Mm. And so I've been able to see a lot of my friends have that are from that area that I grew up with are there. And so they can visit or I can see them um, it's there's a different connection you hope to the same as i said before provide them that um that that connection with god as best you can and and then now too with with various uh social networks and our ministry is so broad that you still have connection with other people and um with your friends with your family and all that the culture right now all you you know every time you turn on the television it's talking about sex yeah. every magazine is right. a lot of you know, indecent exposure. That's right. That's right. Um, what, you know, the time I grew up, what seemed to be terrible is now acceptable. the norm, acceptable in the media. How do you deal with chastity? Mm-hmm. And then the second, um, this, the second vow that I find challenging is obedient. Mm-hmm. What do you say to those people who are having tough time with those issues? Well, I, I would like to address the issue of chastity, because that is certainly the most countercultural of the vows, being that we live in a culture that is saturated um, by these uh, images and and the mentality of promiscuity in many ways, especially as it's presented predominantly in the media. Personally, growing up, I remember, um, you know, being crazy for girls like in second grade and that just developed and developed and developed and by the time I was sixth grade um, it was like already my mindset was that the idea of saving yourself for marriage sexually um, was already like considered irrelevant old-fashioned passe doesn't apply anymore 
And so the message and, and the impressions that I had in myself as growing up was you weren't a man unless you were experienced. Mm. You weren't validated as a man unless right. you were sexually experienced with a woman. And so the whole idea of chastity was, couldn't be more foreign to my mindset growing up. And that wasn't because of um, a lack of uh, education and responsibility and how my mom trained me. She always provided good morals, but the culture is just so saturated in it. Mm -hmm. And we take it in in our music and in our movies and, mm -hmm. and everything. It's just that's, that's speaking a stronger message than the 10 minutes we hear at church. Yeah. So that was a major stronghold in regards to being called to live that life. What do you see as your vision for um, the order here in the U.S. and your plan um, coming back to, you know, now that the order is in the U.S.? Go ahead. Well, we've been in the U.S. for, for, yeah. for a while. Yeah, a um, but, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm the senior here, um, 38 years in the order, and certainly I've been edified this morning or today to hear uh, what these young religious uh, feel and think and aspire to. And I, I, I just, uh, my vision is that they be given every opportunity to grow in their relationship to Christ and to increase in their uh, freedom to serve him, you know, so that they have a, uh, uh, the greatest generosity that they, we can we can elicit, you know, that we can help them, help them be generous. Now that sounds a little bit too vague, I suppose, and idealistic. But specifically, um, we have souls to save. You know, there's a lot of people who are really wandering in darkness. And Christ, we mentioned the world. Christ is the light of the world, and He's given us. Uh, that light, you know, he is in us and we are his light in this world. I know that may sound a little bit uh, uh, presumptuous or arrogant. I don't mean that we're, uh, you know, we, we ourselves have our darknesses and we're working on that. But we also should not um, be um, insecure about the, the message that we have. It's a great message. And even though I'm such a weak clay vessel, um, and I maybe spend more time trying to blow the light out than, than share it. But nevertheless, the light is Christ, and that is worth sharing. So I would, uh, uh, again, I'm maybe not showing real practical things, but uh, the new evangelization, we want these young men to be well-formed and well educated, learned, able to carry the word of God and, and you know, develop also their, their interiority because we didn't speak much about that, but that's a, a very uh, important part of the charism of Carmel and the Theresian Carmel, and especially to really have a, a, a deep interior life, which is, say, a very intimate relationship with Christ through prayer and contemplation. Well, thank you, fathers and um, brothers and Friars for sharing um, with us, especially uh, for an outsider who has no clue about uh, the Carmelites way. And there are many ways it looked like um, one can be part of the Carmelites family. Um, so before we end, would uh, you kindly give us your um, final prayer and blessing? We give you thanks, Almighty God, for your love for us which we could never earn or deserve. We offer you our lives that we may become who we are called to be in your love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.